It's ten years this month since Malcolm Noble's first mystery novel was published. The world of Malcolm Noble's crime fiction. We're going to mark those ten years with a look behind the pages. How does he write? What does he read? What fires him up about his life as a mystery writer? The Thirteen books are based in the south of England, but Malcolm has lived for thirty years in Market Harbour, where he and his wife run a tiny bookshop tucked away in the town centre. Bookshop. This is the desk where I put pen to paper for most of our, my books. Uh, generally, I write in fountain pen so that uh, it slows me down, I write more carefully than I can read what I've written. Um, usually on scraps of paper. I've never written uh, any manuscript in a, in a notebook or exercise book. I do make copious notes and I'll sort of speak about that later on. But at this stage, when I get to write things down, it's on uh, paper bags, backs of envelopes, and it all goes into a biscuit tin. When the biscuit tin is full, that's when I have to start write, typing it up. And, and that's when the real work begins with, with editing and, uh, and so on. It's not a very tidy way of working. Uh, there's plenty of interruptions and I'm sure it wouldn't suit many writers, but for me it does seem to work. While I put pen to paper indoors, the creative stuff has to happen outside for me. And most of my books have been composed in the little courtyard outside the bookshop. Across South Leicestershire and North Northamptonshire, Moly, Moly. 102.3. In 2010, 102.3 HFM asked Malcolm how he wrote his books. Well, it takes about four months to write. Yeah. That's not saying that I could do three a year because they're quite exhausting. Really. Do you sort of go in a, a sort of quiet room away from all in, and get your imagination running away from you and you write a few lines and then you sort of add to it? And things I, like that? I've got my own particular way. I try and learn 600 words at a time. And when I know that I can recite 600 words, which is about a page and a half, Half. Okay. I think, okay, if I can remember it, then it's got to be close to being right. Do you ever put something down and think, well, what was that I wrote? Oh, yes, all the, you know, us, all the time. Well, I was saying us men, me particularly, I mean, I've got spidery doctors writing. I can't even read it myself, and yeah. anybody else, so, you know. Yeah. Yes, it, oh, all the time. Yeah? All the time, and it's frustrating. Yeah. You uh, think, what is that? What is it I wrote? Especially since if you're writing quickly, it's because it's good. And of course, you come back next month, and you, you mm. can't you can't decipher it. I also work at home, and again, it's outside in the garden. It's only while I've been making this video that I've realised the truth that I need to be outside if I want to compose or create anything. Rainy days are really no good to me. As we look round, we can see what we might call my creative spaces. Here is a particular favourite of mine. My wife and I call this Stonehenge. I've spent many hours here debating with my characters and unfairly putting them in situations that they find it difficult to get out of. When we come to talk about how each individual book has been written, of course there's no one story. Every book is different. I do tend to start by getting the first few lines right, the first sentence or the first paragraph. And once I've got that right, it's very rare that I change it. I like to think that those first few lines set the direction of travel and keep me on track. In many books I like to write the key episodes first, again to make sure that they work and they act as signposts along the story to make sure that I'm not diverting from the book that I wanted to write. I remember that Piggy Tucker's Poison was written in a particular way. I memorised the first chapter as I was driving down the M1. I joined at Junction 20 by the time I got to Heathrow I had memorised the first chapter, I could recite it. I have to say, Piggy Tucker's Poison does not have a long first chapter. Although I don't plan in detail, I do know where I'm going and generally how I'm going to get there. I suppose you could say, I don't plan, but I do prepare very well. And I guess this is where I need to talk about my notebook. I have dozens of notebooks full of diagrams, maps, silly drawings, timelines, but as I look through them now, I realise that I rarely go back to them when I'm writing the books. Rather, I use them to explore my ideas. If you like, it's through the notebooks that I get to know my characters and their world before I start to write the novel.
I'm not going to ask you your age because that's rude, but how did you get into writing all these mystery novels? That's the first question. OK, I'm 61, so it's, it's your being rude. Um, <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, I didn't think I'm, you were going to tell me that. I was laid up in a hotel room for three days mm. and uh, uh, because I was poorly. OK. It was overlooking Portsmouth Harbour and I just started to write about the harbour and that, that developed into the detective story. When Tim Biddick's first case was released, it did seem a bit of an anticlimax. I got one or two promising reviews in the provincial press, but nothing seemed to be happening. I remember that in the early weeks, only 14 libraries took copies of the books, and I was feeling pretty glum. Then the Nottingham Post were generous enough to devote a double-page spread in their weekend supplement to the novel. And from that point, other people began to take an interest, and I began to gather my readership. And finally, a Market Harbour author has made it into the top 40 list of the favourite historical novelists of 2013. Malcolm Noble, who runs the second-hand bookshop Book Cabin in Coventry Road, is named in the list that's been collated by the Historical Novel Society. Over a thousand authors were nominated, with Malcolm being named 40th on the list. That's the latest from the HFM News Centre. Here's what the papers say. Good fun, fast and a most enjoyable read. This is parochial policing at its best. Noble has a fine knack of creating a sense of place and atmosphere. He has created an intriguing set of characters. A marvellous creation, Noble reels off a first-rate story. This fantastic village who done it. Intricately plotted, suspenseful, darkly funny and beautifully written. A mesmerising murder mystery. A dead good read. If you like your murder mysteries, these books are for you. This fantastic new novel leaves you begging for the next in the series. I can't imagine a time when I'll stop writing, but I can't say that I enjoy the publishing process. Those weeks between the first review copies being sent out and you getting a first reaction to the book are dreadful, and many times I thought, you really don't have to put yourself through this. But the thing that keeps me publishing is the interaction between myself and my readers, and of course this is much easier these days, especially when the author can always be found every day in his book. Here's a model of an Austin Somerset, which a reader who lives on the canals gave me when he read that Ned McRae uh, drove a similar car. A cigarette lighter from a reader's family who thought that Ned would be very happy with it. Another car, this time for Take Seven Cooks, a play. With this tobacco tin, a reader suggested that PC Pinch should change his smoking habits, and after some research, I did introduce the brand into Murder in a Paris Chest. A reader took one of my books on holiday and brought me back, or sent me, a packet of shortbread. And here's a photograph from a reader, which I still use as one of my profile pictures. I've always regarded library users as an important part of my readership. They're very knowledgeable and always keen to let you know what they think of your books, so I'm delighted to meet them. More than anything else, writing is a craft. And the craftsman's job, whether he's a cabinet maker, sculptor, painter, dancer, glass maker, whatever, the craftsman's job is to transfer his vision his image of his work in his head to a way that it can be presented to the public and in the writer's case that means on the page. So my job is to produce exactly to the word the book that I wanted to write. Now that requires me to prepare well to make sure that I have a good vision of what I want to produce. I need to know my book well before I start to write it. And then, when I present it for publication, I know that I have fashioned this work into exactly the product that I wanted to produce. And when it is published, of course, then we have to let go, and the world must make of it what they will. The comments, views, and feedback from my readers is very important to me. I'm very conscious of the time, emotional commitment, not to mention money, and where I take account of those collectors who have bought special editions and the associated merchandise, that is quite a sum. I know that no matter how people have come across my work, I am very privileged when they decide to read what I have written. And so the readers certainly have a say 
in where my work is going, the direction that I take. Frankly, that is why the books continue to appear. I hope you'll take a peek at my social media, Malcolm Noble's Timberdick Mysteries is the Facebook page, and at Mount Noble is my Twitter account. Currently there are about 80 videos on my YouTube channel and great fun is my Pinterest board where I like to sneak one or two unusual photographs. And if you go to the front page of my website MalcolmNoble.com you'll find a link to the weekly audio newsletter that I produce as a podcast. The last 10 years has been great fun. I've now got many new friends that I wouldn't be without. I hope that this video has provided you with a behind the scenes glimpse at the world of Malcolm Noble's crime fiction. Please join in. I've got this great idea for a book. It's going to be with new characters and set in the late 50s, an era I haven't written about before. And it's going to be about the world of Malcolm Noble's crime fiction.